Okay, in this movie I'm going to describe the essential components of potassium homeostasis and any homeostatic mechanism has some major components. It has names for when something gets too low or too high. It has mechanisms to deal with too low or too high. Causes of things getting too low and too high. And effects of getting too low or too high. And we're going to go through all of those in this diagram. One of the other things we're going to do is talk about why it's so important. And that's where I'm going to start. So first of all, the reason potassium is important is because it plays a role in the sodium potassium ATPase. Three sodiums are pumped outside of a cell. Two potassiums are pumped in a cell. And that sets the voltage of the membrane. So if we have an increased K, we're going to depolarize. If we have a decreased K, we're going to hyperpolarize. That membrane voltage then is going to affect things like the pacemaker potential of the heart. So that's going to affect how fast the heart beats. Cardiac muscle potential, that's going to be contractility. We're talking about neuron action potentials and muscle action potentials. Another key about potassium is it has an effect on acidosis and alkalosis. And the reason is, is because potassium and hydrogen ion exchange across the cell membrane. An alternative theory on that is that maybe hydrogen affects the sodium potassium ATPase. In any case, what happens in hyperkalemia is we're actually going to get acidosis. And what happens in hypokalemia is we're going to get alkalosis. We're going to get basic. We're going to go through all of this real, real soon. And actually where we're going to start is what are the names. So let's go through those parts of a homeostatic diagram. Starting with, it's called hypokalemia if potassium gets too low. It's called hyperkalemia if potassium gets too high. Let's then talk about what are going to be the causes of hyperkalemia. Now the first one is a little bit tricky. Alkalosis is going to cause hypokalemia. And the reason it's tricky is because it's not really well understood, but the basic way of thinking about it is right here that hydrogen and potassium exchange across the cell membrane. So in alkalosis, there's low hydrogen. And that hydrogen is going to cause the hydrogen that's in the cell to leave the cell, to balance the loss of hydrogen outside the cell. What's going to happen then is what little potassium there is outside the cell will then enter the cell in exchange. And so now we're going to have hypokalemia, too low of potassium. One of the tricky things about this is then hydrogen, CO2, potassium, and we'll get to in the calcium diagram, calcium are all interrelated. Essentially, if one of them goes up, all of them go up. The hydrogen-calcium connection is a little bit tricky, but I'll mention it briefly. This albumin is a protein that flows in the blood. Essentially, it's there to provide osmotic pressure so fluid will come back into capillaries. But the thing about albumin is it has these large negative charges that need to be balanced by positive ions. It doesn't really matter whether it balances it with calcium or hydrogen. What that means then, if there's more hydrogen around, it's going to bind to that albumin, kick the calcium up, so calcium levels will go up. Or if there's low hydrogen, it's going to come off the albumin to balance the loss of hydrogen. That means calcium can then leap onto the albumin, and that's going to lower calcium. So again, the take-home message here is that an increase in acid causes an increase in CO2, can cause an increase in potassium, and it can also lead to an increase in calcium. Or all four of them go down together at the same time, too. So that's why alkalosis affects potassium and technically affects CO2 and calcium as well. That's also the reason vomiting and constipation will cause hypokalemia, because each of those will cause alkalosis. Vomiting, because a pool of acid is lost when vomiting, and that no longer balances the basic small intestine. And if you lose that pool of acid in your stomach, then you become basic because you're no longer balancing that base. In the case of constipation, digestive material is moving through the GI tract really slowly. And while it's moving slowly, there's more than adequate time, too much time really, to absorb bicarbonate. I might want to watch the video on pH balance to understand how bicarbonate works. But essentially, bicarbonate is base. And so if you've got more time to absorb that base, you're going to become basic. And that's going to lead to hypokalemia. An unbalanced diet, one low in potassium, can also lead to hypokalemia. So the GI tract is not particularly good at absorbing potassium. So if you don't get enough potassium in your diet, which is generally not an issue, but that can lead to hypokalemia. Diuretics often reduce potassium levels as well because as that fluid is being flushed out, you get a high GFR, and with the high GFR, you tend to lose that potassium. It doesn't have time to work its way back out of the filtrate and into the peritubular capillaries. There are other mechanisms that can cause renal loss, things like not enough sodium-driven reuptake in the proximal convoluted tubule. The last thing is hyperaldosteronism. Aldosterone basically causes sodium to be reabsorbed, but in exchange, it's losing potassium into the filtrate because it's stimulating that sodium potassium ATPase. And so if we stimulate aldosterone and we stimulate the sodium potassium ATPase, we necessarily put more potassium into the filtrate. So that can cause hypokalemia. So let's go over here and look at the causes of potassium imbalances, specifically hyperkalemia. 
And as would be expected, most of the causes of hyperkalemia are very similar to the causes of hypokalemia, only moving in the opposite direction. So just as alkalosis caused hypokalemia, acidosis causes hyperkalemia. In this case, the hydrogen enters the cell, so there's a lot of acid on the outside of the cell. So a lot of acid on the outside of the cell. It runs into the cell and kicks potassium out because of this exchange. Now we've got too much potassium outside the cell, and that leads us to hyperkalemia. Because potassium is concentrated in all of our cells, anything that damages those cells can cause a huge cellular release of potassium that would lead to hyperkalemia. Some basic examples would be burns, where you're damaging lots of cells. Any kind of major trauma, where you're injuring lots of cells or tissue. Chemotherapy, where you're poisoning cells, can also cause a release of potassium. Or even things like rapid weight loss. Too much potassium in a diet obviously can lead to hyperkalemia. And then kidney failure, where you're failing to excrete the potassium, can lead to hyperkalemia. In hypoaldosteronism, there's not enough aldosterone to cause a reuptake of sodium. Remember, when sodium was reuptake, potassium was excreted. So now if we don't have enough aldosterone to take up that sodium, we also don't have enough aldosterone to secrete the potassium. And so that potassium builds up, leading to hyperkalemia. A major example of hypoaldosteronism would be Addison's disease. Diabetes might seem a little odd here, but it's a really important mechanism for getting potassium out of the extracellular fluid when we consume food that has high doses of potassium. Essentially, in any meal that we eat, we have a lethal dose of potassium more than, the, than what's intracellularly, so we need to get that into the cells really, really quickly. The mechanism to do that is insulin. So once insulin is released, it tells cells to take up this potassium quickly so it can't hang around long enough outside of cells to be poisonous. Beta blockers can also lead to hyperkalemia because they're blocking potassium channels. Also, intense exercise, we can cause a huge release of potassium as we exercise, as we continually activate those muscles. We're releasing potassium because of the excess action potentials that let potassium outside of cells. So intense exercise can also lead to hyperkalemia. Now, these latter three are fairly weak on their own, but if there's a combination of all three, that could actually lead to cardiac arrest. So if you're on beta blockers and do intense exercise, you can actually get hyperkalemia strong enough to cause cardiac arrest. Let's then move on to the effects over here of hypokalemia. And just as with sodium, any kind of disruption of potassium can be expected to affect cell membrane potential. And by extension, then, that's going to affect neuronal function, autorhythmic cell function, cardiac muscle function, and any other muscle. And then once you've affected those muscles, you can affect the respiratory system because you need those muscles in order to breathe, to respirate, to ventilate. Specifically, if there's less potassium on the outside of the cell, this causes hyperpolarization. So all the cells will have difficulty being activated. They're way below threshold now. Neurons will be much less likely to fire. That's going to cause CNS dysfunction. Less potassium will allow repolarization to happen more quickly in autorhythmic cells. This might actually increase heart rate. However, the depolarization of the muscle cells will be, will be reduced. That's going to reduce the ability of calcium to enter. Remember, calcium comes in at phase two as potassium is leaving. So now because the cell is hyperpolarized, it's going to be more difficult to get up to the threshold to get plenty of calcium come in to come in and contractility will be reduced. We can then look at regular muscle, skeletal muscle. And obviously, if this muscle is hyperpolarized, it's going to be more difficult to activate this muscle. Therefore, it's going to cause weakness muscle weakness, and perhaps respiratory arrest. 